a very good morning to all present here today on today's webinar. I'm Professor Gorda Vorua from the Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship. Uh, this is the third of the series of webinar organized by IIE under the aegis of Northeastern Regional Entrepreneurship and Startup Summit. Today, we are going to do something on the agri, agri space. And in the agri space, we've identified two aspects. We, in fact, in the entire day, we're going to have webinars. And these two webinars are going to touch upon two very important aspects of in the agriculture space, which is one is using technology for agri agriculture, and the second in the afternoon will be covering on the supply chain. So all that we are looking at is post-COVID, um, you know, using how technology can be an enabler for agribusiness. And second, tomorrow in the afternoon, we are going to look at the theme would be reimagining markets and sales channels. COVID. Now, before introducing the speakers and the moderator, I'd like to introduce uh, the team behind Neris. Here we have um, Amitabh Dutta. <laughs> We have Anusia Mahanta, who's a project lead in IAE. We have Sagar Kumar. And uh, the entire this agri uh, webinar was being conducted by the Harajuti. Harajuti is also there. Mm -hmm. the people behind organizing the webinar. And now I would request um, our director, Dr. Abhijit Sharma, to give the opening remarks and also you know, give a background about Neris before we take it forward and we introduce the speakers. Thank you, Sripurna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar series, uh, which we are, like Sripurna said, uh, which we have kick-started uh, from uh, 12th onwards. Uh, this is the third of the series. And the theme which is very, very important, I think agriculture and particularly post-COVID, I think this is one of the major sector that is probably going to kickstart the economy. And uh, for the Northeast, I think this is one of the sectors which is uh, which probably will be the most uh, sector which will drive the economy for the Northeast. Uh, I, uh, as you all are aware, is an institute under the Ministry of uh, Skill and Entrepreneurship and uh, has been working in terms of building up entrepreneurs uh, through various uh, services. And uh, in various stages, it has been taking also innovative steps. <clears throat> uh, as we ventured uh, uh, last year, uh, we found that there is this new group of entrepreneurs which are coming into the economic space or uh, in, the, in the Northeast, uh, which we call as the startup space. And we felt that we need to engage with them. Uh, that's how uh, we build up something called the NERES, the Northeast Entrepreneurship and Startup Summit, which we have jointly organizing with FINA and being sponsored by NEC. Uh, the idea is that we provide a platform to some of these people who would uh, be able to take their business ideas to a commercial venture as we go forward. And we felt that uh, in the entire ecosystem, we do have startup. Uh, uh, we also have Katikian here, uh, who's from the, the NATO hub. So we have the whole lot of incubation uh, players. But we felt that the beginning of the funnel is something which was a little weak. And we felt that that is something that we need to plug in. And that's how the NERES was derived. And uh, that's how we're looking at providing some sort of a boost through a grant mechanism of uh, this is a five lakh grant that eventually the nearest uh, people who will be pitching, 20 people will be giving 20 a five lakh grant. And then kicks are pushing them through another mechanism that we're looking at as of, sort of a uh, ideation grant and seed front as we go forward. Uh, so that is something that I is looking at, at least building up the initial, uh, I would call the initial part of the funnel for the startup space or the startup ecosystem to take forward. Uh, I would like to thank, like Sripana said, of uh, the IE team, which is in, I mean, the NERES team within IE, who's been taking up this, but more particularly people who have been our, uh, I would call, uh, well-wishers. Uh, Gunajit Brahma is one of them who will be the moderator today for the session. They are the people who are really spearheading or guiding us in terms of the se sector-specific uh, intervention that is required. And today, in fact, it is thanks to Gunajit Brahma that we could get uh, these group of people, a galaxy of panelists, ex eminent panelists, and of course the other people who can really benefit from this. Uh, so with this, 
uh, I would like to again welcome all of you. And uh, we hope that this, uh, this one hour, one and a half hours will be really beneficial for all of us. Thank you. Over to you, Sriparna. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we are now going to the session and I would, before handing over the entire thing to Gunajit, I would again like to, for again, once again, thank Gunajit Brahma for, you know, helping us shape and give us shape to this uh, webinar in terms of deciding on the topic, deciding on the speakers, as we had um, internally thought after discussion with many entrepreneurs who are with us, that we want something which can give local solutions and also bring our people who are actually working from this region. So with that in mind, we have called in four speakers. And these four speakers, uh, we have two speakers from the incubation space and two speakers, again, entrepreneurs uh, from the region who have actually used technology as a facilitator for doing agribusiness. So we are very lucky to have the four panelists uh, with us along with the moderator i would like first like to introduce very quickly introduce our panel members we have with us dr kartikya who is the agritech incubation who's from the uh, agritech incubation from assam agricultural university is a pro kartikya is a project management professional and brings in 24 years of experience planning diverse functions ranging from mentoring startups monitoring and evaluation of fpos and capacity building and training of farmer groups to strategic corporate responsibility, consulting, sustainability reporting, spearheading NGOs, investment promotion, building industry, and trade relation. In the past, she has worked with leading organizations such as NABAD, Consultancy Services, Jenison Burson, Mask Teller, Confederation of Indian Industries. So welcome, Dr. Kartikya, to this um, um, webinar. Then we have um, Mr. Ashish Khetan, Chief Mentor and Investment Officer of the Indigram Lab Foundation. Ashish Khetan is a Chief Investment Officer at Indigram, Indigram Lab Foundation. He previously worked with leading MSC and MNCs like GE and Morgan Stanley. And then he ventured into entrepreneurship in agri-commodity trading and agri-processing space for another seven years. And since the last three years, has been, he has been instrumental in building Indigram Labs dominant presence across India, creating success stories for incubated companies. So welcome, uh, Dr. Mr. Ashish Khetan, to this webinar. We look forward to your you know, views and your experience, sharing your views and experience and also mentoring a lot of startups which have come here for this webinar. Then we have two entrepreneurs from this region, one from Meghalaya, one from Manipur. Uh, we have Gavin Shulai, Program Manager, uh, iTeams. 1917 IT, Integrated Technology Enabled agri ma Agriculture Management Systems. Gavin is a management graduate with 17 years of experience in private sector, mainly in sales and marketing and operations. He joined 1917 IT teams in 2018 with the intention to create a system for farmers in the state to enable, channelize their produce to a profitable market. Having worked throughout the Northeast and seeing the untapped potential of agri-produce everywhere, he strongly believes that we could develop more entrepreneurs at the, from the village level and offer them alternate livelihood. That is the need of the hour. And we, I'm sure we're going to be greatly enriched by when he shares his experience as to how he's going about. Then we have Rajeshwar Oinam, who's the CEO of Sagri Company Limited. Rajeshwar Oinam is the CEO co-founder of Sagri Company uh, limited. Sagri is an agri-focused ag, ag tech startup which provides assistance to the farmers. He continues to be the advisor and mentor of many budding entrepreneurs and startups. He started his entrepreneurial journey when he sold his company to an American startup, Mixercast Incorporated in 2006. He started O Cricket in 2007, which got acquired in 2009. The, company, the team then went on to in, from Infinity Beta and later Help Shift. Incorporated USA. His fourth startup, Levona, was, start, was the first Indian startup to graduate from Founder Institute of San Francisco Bay Area cohort in 2011. Two years he worked with creative director in Razor Fish, one of the world's largest interactive agencies at their Bangalore branch. Now he heads India Initiative as CEO Sagri, focusing on solving agriculture problems in South Asia region, especially India. So welcome, Rogan Rajeshwar. Oinam, I'm sure people like you are going to be the, the you know, role models for 
entrepreneurs of this region. Welcome. Finally, Gunajit, of course, is the person who's conceived, discussed with us, and come. He's going to moderate. I'm going to hand over the entire webinar to uh, conducting this entire webinar to Gunajit Brahma, who's the managing director of Jivangsh uh, Eco Products Private Limited. He's an award-winning social entrepreneur who got an award from the Ministry of Skill and Entrepreneurship in 2016-17. He's an en environmental activist, writer, poet, social worker. And an EV owner. Presently, he's working as a director of Jivangsh Eco Private Limited. And then, a lot of he's a director in a number of companies. Plus, he's also a visiting faculty to I am I am Indoor. Uh, he has about 12 years of professional experience, of which eight years has been an entrepreneur in the agri business and renewable energy, and rest as a research analyst for a multinational KPO in India. So welcome, Gunujit, and I now hand over everything to Gunujit. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's a great privilege to be part of uh, NERIS, uh, one of the first uh, national level and uh, Northeast Entrepreneurship Summit, and then be part of this webinar also, which will take over, uh, which has been in ideation since a couple of months, I guess. Yeah, we have promoted it for some time now, but then we feel the need of the hour is that we have to have the discussion today so that you know um, the startups or the entrepreneurs who are uh, working in the agri sector get benefit out of it and then they can uh, think of building up if they have not already built up something new or if they have built it up then scale it up to the next level so uh, as, as the as ma'am has already said so already said the speaker lineup is like that that there are two integrators and then two from the agri tech uh, domain or sectors which uh, then they will share their experiences as well as uh, their idea of what should be the uh, you know uh, approach of agri businesses for uh, post covid 19 uh, world in uh, across the globe so okay so the uh, first speaker we have is dr karthik who will primarily speak about the role of incubators uh, in supporting the ecosystem for uh, entrepreneurs and agri businesses and also touch upon what are the agri innovation, uh, what is the technological innovation happening in agri businesses in the Northeast. So, yeah, over to you, uh, Dr. Karthi. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunajit. And uh, thank you. I would like to thank uh, Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship, uh, Dr. Abhijit Sharma ji, um, Sri Parna ma'am, and of course, Har Jyoti and others out here. It's a great initiative because uh, in, in the times that we are in currently, I think, yeah, I think the way things are moving, we need to really reinvent how we are able to present to people, contact with people virtually. So without much ado, I would like to uh, quickly tell you what uh, our incubation center has been doing. I've prepared a small little uh, presentation, which I would love to share with you all. Uh, just give me a second. Let me just start sharing the screen. Um, Yes. Well, yes. Sir. Yeah. Is this is this visible? All right, and I'm audible as well. I hope. Yes. All right. Great. Okay. So um, to give you um, uh, my uh, th this whole uh, topic that we are having today on what incubation support can do to entrepreneurs and startups. Um, Let's go back to what, what makes it, what, where this origin of the word called incubator comes from. As you can see it on the screen, uh, I have just tried to capture for you. Uh, when we say incubator, what comes to our mind is a, a bird sitting on an egg, trying to give it kind of right ambient temperature, making sure that it hatches and going forward, then the you know, young uh, fledgling comes out. And then after some time, it uh, tries to struggle tries to look for food around it and after some time then the mother bird starts fetching food trying to feed the bird and then wings are getting created and even at that point in time it gets its right due support from the mother bird then the fledgling with those kind of wings that it develops uh, it tries to garner some more you know strength tries to fly but can't do much so the mother bird tries to you know hold its uh, you know being and uh, finally try to get it protected from predators and whatnot. And slowly and steadily, the fledgling 
gathers enough strength to fly out. So this is typically how we could, uh, if you were to relate it with a business incubator, uh, that's exactly what an incubator tries to do. When a fledgling business uh, tries to start, and when it starts, it needs a host of, uh, you know, things to start doing business. Uh, right from the word go, whether the idea works, whether the market is ready for it, how disruptive is this idea, whether going forward it has the right kind of uh, technical expertise, the right team for it, even when it wants to register itself as a legal entity, does it have the sound understanding? So, so on and so forth. You need a host of things that will help uh, uh, business to start uh, going forward, becoming what it is as a legal entity. So that is what we uh, call as a uh, ecosystem. And for any entrepreneur or a startup as a business, you need this. Uh, so the purpose, entire purpose of that incubation center is to give it a platform where these kind of ideas which are coming up, they are a little more, uh, you know, curated perhaps, refined, uh, so that then it can become, you know, worthy of investing at some point in time. Investing not just in terms of funding, but maybe investing in terms of giving it the right support system, mentoring it, uh, maybe even facilitating, you know, market links and uh, all of that. So that's exactly what a business incubator does. That's the purpose. But at no point in time, because we find a lot of people coming to us at an incubator here, that uh, what is the idea I can work on? They come to us with that. So we say, no, this is actually your baby. So you should come up to us and let us know what you wish to do. While we can help you in curating that and taking it to a level that you can call it a business. So that's the intended purpose of a business incubator. So we at Northeast Agri Technology Entrepreneurs Hub, uh, it is a, a Section 8 company registered in the, under the Companies Act. We are an Atal Incubation Center under the AGs of the Assam Agricultural University. And uh, we have also got uh, funding from the RKBY under the Department of Agriculture, the Rashtriya Krishi Vigyan Yojana. They have a scheme called Raftar, which is uh, supporting agribusiness uh, incubation, uh, incubates basically. So that is what we are for you. And uh, something good has happened is that while our focus for this incubator is the entire Northeast region, uh, we are also supporting uh, establishment and operations for three more incubators here in the Northeast. Under the Central Agri University, there is a uh, agribusiness incubator that's come up in Arunachal Pradesh, under the uh, which is focusing on agri forest, agroforestry and horticulture. We have one in Tripura that is focusing on fisheries, and one in Mizoram which is focusing on veterinary sciences. So people coming in from any of the they're getting the right kind of uh, technical guidance there. And as it goes for business mentoring, we are trying to pull in resources from across the country. We are also having a host of uh, partners because we believe that uh, we alone cannot be doing everything. So the, the concept is to co-create by partnering with the right kind of people who are already doing this work and not doing work in isolation. So just to give you a snapshot of what kind of services we are talking about, right from legal, to IPR, to tech commercialization, to funding. Uh, there's a lot of legwork that we have done and we are very happy. We also have a partner in Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship, on, uh, Entrepreneurs and um, uh, Eco and KVKs and whatnot. So the whole idea is to bring in uh, these kind of budding um, young entrepreneurs from anywhere here in the Northeast, give them the right kind of an ecosystem that they can flourish. So what happens at our center is, this is our service portfolio. We have four working spaces here. We have pilot production facilities that we give for startup entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a lot of facilities for seminars and you know meeting rooms and all of that which a typical company might need, including an address. If there's a startup who is going to be with us for an year's time and they need to have a startup address for them, just our facility is completely plug and play for them. We have the right kind of hardware, software for them. Uh, we have all kinds of labs, dry labs, wet labs, including um, digital labs. So smart digital agri is what we are talking about. So we are getting into that. Uh, of course, you are also able to see a plethora of other things like uh, we have interns since we are virtually situated. We are actually in a university. We have right kind of access for interns uh, who are here around us looking for. So we blend them, combine those kind of efforts to help our startups and entrepreneurs. 
uh, we are getting into a mode we are trying to get uh, support from uh, donor ministry uh, moving forward we are trying to get some funding also from csr uh, corporates around us so this is the uh, host of things that we are doing as a service portfolio offering currently this is our uh, spectrum of uh, startups right from specialty teas to you know animal feed uh, processing a uh, lot of packaging which is happening and of course like gunajit also is one of our startups here uh, things which are uh, very uh, very akin to northeast produce so organic uh, non organic also uh, but anything that can be added value to and create something more as a niche uh, farming as a service digital agriculture so these are the kind of things we are talking about this is the spectrum we have closed about 40 entrepreneurs as of as of now um, i will take you through what we did but quickly to come to uh, the last couple of slides this is what uh, to give you an idea of what our current uh, you know startups uh, have done so we have alok who is one of our young budding entrepreneur he has been working in the area of uh, fresh vegetables and fruit supply so when this covid lockdown happened um, he quickly resorted to moving into creation of a mobile app and transaction as you know people places like jorhat guwahati it's not so popular people like to go buy fresh vegetables touch feel by you know all that so to establish a kind of a trust uh, was something that was not either to look at but this covid came in as a blessing blessing people were able to place their orders so this is the kind of work he has done almost about 4000 odd uh, transactions and above he has done uh, close about 500 metric tons of fresh vegetables and fruit is what he has supplied both in jorhat and guwahati combined what comes innovative here is that he also tied up with a peer incubate of uh, his batch who incubated here at our center by leveraging his presence in guwahati so they were able to expand it between these two cities i'll take another 2 minutes we also have a, a incubate in uh, manoj basumatari who is uh, gunajit's uh, uh, you know contemporary and uh, he is known as a pig man of northeast uh, by a by background he has been a banker for almost 15 years then he ventured into his own uh, you know setup called symbiotic foods limited which is started in 2013 uh, he has been into artificial inseminization of uh, pigs and right now because of this lockdown there's a lot of uh, issues with small farmers small pig farmers fine so he's able to reach out to them give them on a cost to cost basis close to about 15 metric tons of feed he has supplied and the double whammy in this case has been this african swine fever and uh, he has been spreading a lot of uh, you know awareness and programs he's doing doing thanks to virtual world that we are right now in another case that i could uh, refer to is uh, nitin who has been working again a sonapur based uh, entrepreneur closer to guwahati uh, selling through his brand fresh do a lot of fresh vegetables and fish especially because this time people have not been able to get a lot of that supply on a regular basis or well, last not the least is watila long kumar a woman entrepreneur of ours from imphal Uh, who has been into floriculture and this is the time she has been working in fact uh, instead of getting into the collection mode she has been working directly with those micro entrepreneurs uh, at the ground level getting fresh and cut flowers across uh, so there are just a few examples i could go on we have another 5 6 to mention but you just you're getting a gist of what i am saying so uh, just to take you through a few photographs this is what we do we go to various colleges schools uh, drum up this entire activity that there is funding is actually not an issue the issue is you are not able to uh, drill down to why do you want to do it why, why is this uh, startup so uh, special to you what kind of a problem is it solving so we we have been doing these kind of outreach programs to uh, you know uh, make them aware that it's no longer a job uh, searching world i think you should become job creators so we have these kind of uh, things right here the last bit is 30 seconds uh, we have two upcoming programs 23rd may is the last date for it you have a lot of information on our website one stage is for idea people who have fantastic innovative idea they can come to us up to a grant of 5 lakhs they could get uh, after due scrutiny and all that the second is for startups of course 10 lakhs to 25 lakhs um, all these details you would find of course on our website and thank you so much i just went through the kind of audience we have you have been amazing thanks for this opportunity thank you dr karthik it was pleasure hearing you so yeah one yeah one thing that i have also observed that over this lockdown period there has been a lot of uh, new technology enabled food delivery systems that has come up integration of uh, forward linkages to provide 
fruits and vegetables and groceries to the market yeah. the back end integration is something that i think the incubators of a niti hub are been able to do it better than a few of the other uh, startups i guess they are very fortunate yes so for all the audience we'll be taking the q and a at the end of all the sessions so we will continue with the next speaker uh, uh, mr ashish khetan who is from indigram labs uh, based out of gurgaon so uh, and mr khetan you can start off with uh, what the what's uh, indigram is you know has uh, or have been able to leverage on technology and how uh, your incubators has been able to you know uh, utilize this uh, lockdown period for the to their advantage over to thank you thank you so much thomas thank you so much gunajit uh, and kartik it was a lovely presentation good to see the kind of activity which is happening in that part of the world thank you uh, just a quick introduction of uh, indigram uh, northeast has been close to our hearts in the past and we've done acceleration programs i'll come to that a bit later um, what we are trying to achieve at indigram is basically creating an entire ecosystem around agri and food so we are not restricting ourselves just to being an incubator accelerator uh, our journey in indigram has been a 20 year old journey now we are an organization with close to 2000 employees with multiple entities uh, the first entity being agri watch which is into market intelligence for non perishable commodities so paddy millets pulses oil seeds spices we provide live mandi pricing across all major 50 mandis in india we do crop cutting experiments for crop insurance we do uh, we provide subscription based reports to individual commodity traders and big commodity trading houses like cargill or lam uh, so market intelligence is first entity which, which which we ventured out in the year 2000 2001 is when we set up uh, isap which is indian society of agri business uh, professionals which today ha has a network of half a million farmers on the ground most of the activities are related to agricultural extension training and mobilizing small holder farmers creation of farmer producer organizations we have close to about 250 farmer producer organizations which isap has created across uh, geographies we worked in close to about 20 states covering 70% of indian geographies we have physical infrastructure in close to about 80 to 100 locations mainly in the form of custom hiring service centers and agri village resource centers uh, so all kinds of activities in terms of uh, sustainable intensification of agriculture uh training and scaling of fpos what needs to be grown where it needs to be sold extension activities around dairy grocery fisheries so that's the kind of work which isap does uh, they are covered uh, in most of those places and uh, have a very deep uh, rural penetration when it comes to rural india 3 years back we set up the incubator accelerator indigram labs foundation uh, we are a tbi funded by department of science and technology and recently we also got an approval for setting up a bionest incubator so that should that should be coming about in the next one month or so we have close to about 40 startups uh, across agri and food domain so agritech in agritech there is precision ag vertical indoor farms farm digitization iot in dairy iot in fisheries food processing consumer brands organic companies marketplace model etc etc uh we also do seed investments under the nidhi triple s scheme where we can invest up to 50 lakhs each in about 8 to 10 companies a year we have so far done 15 investments so far and i would be very glad to say that about four or five companies of ours have gone on to raise anywhere between 2 to 12 million dollars per company in fact during these covid times we've had two companies raising substantial capital one is a 12 million dollar round last year last month by a company called bijak which got funded by sequoia capital and then yesterday there was a news of intello labs raising 6 million dollars so both of them have come out from indigram labs so i would say in our space whether it is pre covid or post covid it hasn't affected investments to that extent and going forward this is a very promising space for investors because this is not this is a recession free uh, sector and this is not discretionary spends you know uh, things like travel leisure hospitality Uh, consumers can wait but food when it comes to agri and food no one can wait so this falls under essential categories so a lot of generic investors which we see they are actually uh, moving towards uh, these sectors and i do see in times to come we'll see a lot more funding coming coming into our space so it is good news for the agri entrepreneurs and like um, uh, you know kartik also said there is no dearth of funding that there should be good ideas an excellent team to do great execution so uh, now coming to uh, technology piece obviously techno agri tech uh, as a sector had started about 5 years back and it is picking up year on year 
Last year, we saw record investments of close to 225 to 250 million US dollars in Indian agri-tech, which was far higher than 2018. And that trend is beginning to even become better and better. So these inventions were already there. It's just that with COVID coming in, a lot of them have been actually have uh, have no other option but to resort to these kind of you know interventions. So there are five to six interventions to my mind which I can uh, talk uh, in general about. One is to do with yield estimation through satellite data. You know, satellite data drones was always available. So in order to calc in order to estimate the kind of uh, farms, their cropping patterns, when is what is going to be harvested when. Satellite imagery can actually give you a lot of uh, accuracy and that has been there. And now I think it, with, with post-COVID scenario, this will uh, come into the picture better. So yield estimation where you don't need anyone, uh, you don't need any foot on the ground with minimum intervention, minimum ground level force possible. A lot of this can be done. Then the, the other piece of technology is to do with demand aggregation. So you have startups already like the Ninja Cart, Udans, you know, the farm to fork kind of models where they are trying to aggregate produce directly from the farmers or the FPOs and give it to the retailers and processors trying to eliminate uh, middlemen. So uh, currently, obviously, a lot of farmers had no other option but to go to an APMC Monday to sell the produce. So that process can be cut short by you know things being picked up at the farm level itself with minimum touch points obviously the food supply chain is very complex not everything can be digitized but at least we can remove certain level of intermediaries and touch points in between to smoothen the supply uh, so that's the next big piece third is to do with uh, digital quality assessment you know now we have companies uh, through image recognition and machine learning where you take a picture of a commodity and it will give you a same parameter that how much is the moisture content, how much is the damage, uh, how much is the foreign matter, damaged particles, etc. just by taking a picture of a commodity. So the machine learning algorithms are trained in such a way where they, where they take 25, 30,000 pictures of each commodity and give you reasonable insights up to 90% accuracy in terms of what you're saying parameters are. So that can be used. That is a very, uh, this has been there in the past, but obviously the, the ability to adapt uh, both from a institutional uh, client perspective as well as from consumers uh, will pick up, which I see. The fourth is basically around digital trade uh, enablement. Right. So Enam as a concept has already been there in the past, but I think it's going to be more effective because they've come out with FPO modules. Then there is electronic warehouse receipts where basically the farmer can actually go to a designated warehouse uh, under the Enam and create an uh, electronic warehousing receipt and trading can be done rather than going to an, going to the Mundi or anything of that sort. So there is digital trade enablement uh, which can happen. Then we have digitized loans as well. What uh, you know, big firms like Rabobank and Samunuti are anyways giving to the FPOs. Uh, and so there is digital warehousing system and digital quality tool, quality tool that can be combined to actually analyze and give uh, uh, loans based on collaterals. Uh, and then obviously there are a lot of uh, marketplace models as well. Marketplace models around farm mechanization. Now we have started seeing marketplace models around livestock, you know, goat trading and you know things like that has also started happening through marketplace models. So a uh, lot of touch points, I would say, would be reduced and then there are innovations. It's just a matter of how, how the consumers are going to adopt. Right now, there is forceful adoption because of social distancing. We'll see whether this leads to a change in consumer behavior or not. So I think uh, from an overall standpoint, uh, uh, there were innovations already, technology-enabled platform. It's just that how the consumers are going to adopt in times to come, we'll have to see. Uh, I think agri-tech is very well, very well placed uh, in the larger scheme of things. And uh, to all the entrepreneurs in this group, whosoever is looking to seriously make agriculture as a career, I would say that this is the best time to be in this space. Uh, we do see a lot of quality talent uh, in the form of entrepreneurs emerging. Uh, uh, the IITs, the Whartons coming back and trying to create some disruption in this uh, space. And also, a lot of them see this as an opportunity because this is a space which is fairly large and yet to be, dis it's still not disrupted. So it offers a lot of opportunity even for entrepreneurs. So I would uh, encourage everyone to take this sector, uh, whosoever is looking at agriculture. And then there is a lot of, co lot of commercial value as well for everyone who is engaged in this space to create a meaningful space. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Khetan. It was a really insightful uh, overview of what uh, agri technology can do, uh, not only in India, I think for the rest of the world as well. Um, just one or two points I would like to uh, just you know share with you. Uh, you have mentioned that there are a lot of uh, the technological intervention that can happen is uh, just to reiterate what you have already said is one is through satellite data uh, imagery which will provide the yield output. I think uh, there are two three companies in India who are doing it as of now. If I'm correct, uh, yeah. But then there are opportunities for other companies also to venture into it. Yeah. Right. And then yeah, demand aggregation is already there. Are uh, companies as you mentioned like Ninja Cart and others. So that is also something that entrepreneurs can look upon. And then the five parameters like a digital platform like Enam. I think uh, Northeast does not have any access to Enam. So I'm not sure if entrepreneurs are able to understand that. Uh, if you can just touch upon one or two points about what ENAM is for uh, our knowledge. So basically, it's, it's an uh, electronic agricultural marketplace where, where a farmer can actually display his stock in the, in the platform and then he gets a quotation from the buyer and the trade execution happens. So basically, the challenges in the past were to do with quality, right? When it comes to food, what, what eventually reaches the, the client and what he deducts these were some of the basic challenges, you know, uh, moisture content missing, there is wastage when transportation is happening and those kind of things. So there have been some interventions to take care of those aspects. And then how do you go about making payments, digital payments are not fully enabled. So all these loose silos have been tweaked and a lot of interventions have happened to ensure that the entire trade flows in a seamless manner. So uh, there has been reasonable success in the South, I think in states like Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh and all. In North yeah. India also we are yet to see, but post COVID government has come out with various modules to try to address the situation. And I think if yeah. fairly things go well, I think Enam is going to get stronger and, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of its adaptation from a, on a state level basis. So one problem with agriculture is also that it's a state subject, right? So yeah. it depends on the proactiveness of the state governments to implement such schemes and what mm -hmm. is it for them. So we'll have to see on a state by state basis, but it, yeah. acceptance and adaptability is increasing with time. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Kitan, for your inputs. Okay, so yeah, now we can go to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Gavin. Uh, Mr. Gavin is from the Department of Meghalaya, Government, uh, yeah, Government of Meghalaya, Department of Agriculture. So they have built upon a platform called ITIN, which is a digital platform that we are talking about uh, that uh, facilitates farmer onboarding, farmer interaction and then selling of the farm produce. So I think Mr. Gavin would be in a better position to tell more about it and then how they have had an advantage of COVID to you know scale up their operations and uh, prevent uh, distress selling of the farmers. Okay, over to you Mr. Gavin. Okay, thank you so much Mr. Gunajit. Uh, <clears throat> I hope I'm audible to everyone. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I have made a small presentation also just that I would not, you know, uh, sort of divert from the main <laughs> discussion. So I'll just introduce uh, what is iTeams all about to everyone. Maybe uh, for many of you would not be aware of what we do. Uh, so I'll just try to share the screen now. Uh, yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, fine. So I think I'll keep it uh, like that. So uh, ITEAMS basically uh, stands for Integrated Technology Enabled Agri Management System. Uh, the number 1917 is actually a short code, okay, where people dial us for using this particular number only from the state. Uh, currently, it is operational only in the state of Meghalaya, but we are looking, uh, we are writing to DOT to get this open nationally so that people can actually call us uh, nationally from this particular number, in this particular number. So what actually led, <clears throat> what actually led uh, to the formation of ITs? Uh, if you look at the ground realities, uh, what a farmer face at the ground. So, you know, there's a lot of disadvantage to him. Uh, I mean, he doesn't have proper access to information, technology, uh, extension is a big challenge everywhere, especially in a hilly state like uh, Meghalaya, where, you know, uh, the outreach programs, there are a lot of agencies which are doing a lot of outreach programs, but it's actually not reaching the, uh, the last point. 
So uh, the low availability of inputs that they require from seed and manure is a big problem. Financing option to a few of them who requires it. Uh, there's almost a zero aggregation if not, you know, I mean, otherwise also it would be a very minimal kind of aggregation that is happening everywhere. So uh, market disadvantage, people are not aware where to sell except to the regular middleman whom they are normally in contact with. And farm evacuation is always a, a, a costly affair to everyone for the simple reason that uh, Meghalaya being a hilly state, evacuation from just a mere 20 kilometers is actually a big chunk of the cost uh, for any produce. So uh, what the government came up with is a program which is, uh, you know, it's ICT driven, cloud based, and we have actually tied this up with Digital India Corporation of, uh, under the Ministry of uh, METI. So uh, this is a cloud-based innovative program that have that where we use the reach of mobile telephony and the uh, power of the internet. You know, though uh, I would not say that we have reached there, but we are still on our journey to be there. So <clears throat> we have a state-supported extension system in the form of uh, Atma. You know, uh, so we have a lot of people on the field who are actually doing a lot of uh, activities. Then uh, Market Connect and intelligence is what we try to do to them. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Abhiji, uh, Mr. Ashish was just talking about marketplace. So we have tried to develop something similar. So uh, we have a list of uh, buyers and a list of farmers who have registered with us and uh, just through their uh, photos, just through their uh, whatever they have put as a small write up of whatever things are available with them, then they connect themselves to the buyer. I just want to say here that I teams do not play any role in any form of negotiation. We do not play any role in, for, in the form of quality uh, guarantee. We do not do any of those things. All we do is basically we connect a farmer looking for a particular produce to, uh, uh, sorry, a farmer looking to sell a particular produce to a buyer looking to buy that particular produce. So at the end, what we do is we just tell them to discuss and talk with each other and then from there, take it forward. And uh, we also have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a fleet of uh, vehicles, which are actually entrepreneur owned and we are operating those vehicles at a very economical rate okay so so that we uh, the intention is to make these reach uh, possible to the farthest of farmers in the state a person who right now will tell i don't have a vehicle to uh, take my produce so i will the moment he calls us he, we will tell him from where to where i, I will send my vehicle I have not put any kind of minimum load requirement also. So a person who has a very minimum quantity of 20 kgs, 50 kgs also, I send a vehicle. And uh, I teams, like I told you, is accessible through 1917. We plan to make it a nationwide number. So it is also currently available through a web portal. And the app is currently in under development. Everything is done on it. We are simply to test it and then we will be rolling it out shortly. <clears throat> then if you look at it, uh, the iGames is more citizen centric. Whatever we are doing is mainly keeping in mind how we can service our state uh, farmers. So we are looking at and rolling every farmers uh, that we have in the state. This is a very, very big task that we have ahead of us. Currently, we have managed to just enroll around 10% of the farmers. We still have another 90% to go. So we are taking the use of uh, the entire extension service of the state. We're telling everyone to come on board with us. The app was developed with this intention so that, you know, uh, no matter where a person go, he can enroll a farmer then and there. So we have made use of mobile connectivity to the last extent. And as we all know now, mobile penetration also is increasing day by day. So I'm hoping that with this, our reach to the farmer also become closer and closer. So uh, the goal of iTeams basically is to provide a transparent platform for the farmers of the state and the buyers to network and connect. Now, what is this basically earlier? What happened, like I was saying, 
you know, the farmer is only aware of that one person, uh, the middleman who he has been dealing with all this while. Now he is the middleman who has been sponsoring him in times of difficulties. He is the middleman who is there during his good times. He is the middleman who is there during his bad times. Now this person cannot leave this middleman. So what happened is that we are trying to bring other uh, channels to the farmer so that you know the farmer has an option to choose. So I'm trying, we are trying our level best and we are now having national buyers willing to connect with our farmers. Yes, I am having difficulties like I told you in the terms of aggregation. Aggregation is very minimal everywhere. So my difficulty, my uh, challenge now is basically to how to aggregate it at the village level, how to aggregate it at a cluster level, at a block level. So that is where I see the role of these village level entrepreneurs, you know person with a good level of knowledge, person with a good level of education who can take this forward for us. So I'm expecting that, you know, with the introduction of iTeams, people will be made more aware of what are the opportunities which are there beyond the state. Not just, I mean, currently they are, they are aware of opportunities in, within their blocks, within their village. But now I'm saying I'll give you opportunities in the state, outside the state, in Guwahati, maybe Siliguri, Calcutta, and so on. So what we're looking at is basically a channel, to, uh, uh, a new channel for the farmers so that they can actually bring in their produce more and more uh, closer to the uh, consumer. So if you look at uh, items, we operate in uh, maybe four domains. Uh, the one domain is the... Uh, is the kind of outreach program that we have. So we are looking uh, at an extension network of uh, close to about 4,000 people which are there in the field. I'm looking at tapping into that. Uh, they, these are all state uh, supported uh, extension networks. So I'm looking at tapping into that whereby, you know, all the information that the state government wants to pass, it, uh, pass down to the farmers can be done through here. Then, like I told you, there is a market connect that we do and uh, through a marketplace that is currently existing in the system, all that people have to do is call 1917. A farmer has to register with us saying that I have so much produce to sell. A buyer has to register with us asking for so much produce to uh, procure. So uh, then the second thing we have is logistic solutions. Like I told you, I am giving in certain places uh, a rate of as low as two paisa per kg per kilometer. And these vehicles are all equipped with GPS. I can see them live in, in my uh, portal. So there's a good, uh, uh, people are also aware that, okay, I can actually track my produce moving to the market from, uh, you know, the comfort of my home. Uh, the app has this facility. The moment they open the app, they can see where the vehicle has reached. They will know whether it has reached the market destination, wherever they want it. The third thing that we are giving is an agro advisory. We have a set of experts with us. Uh, we have level one experts who are in-house experts. These are all graduates uh, of horticulture, agriculture. They are graduate from uh, fisheries, animal husbandry. So these people are my first level connect with the farmers and the buyers. Whoever have any kind of issue from pest management, disease management, unavailability of, uh, unavailability of seeds and inputs, they can always call us to get our, uh, and, and we can give the information accordingly. So the level two experts that we have are people from, you know, the university, people from, um, uh, uh, university and these experts at the state level, KVKs, I'm talking of ICAR. So all these people have been helping us in terms of a lot of issues that we have been having. We are scaling up these issues, the farmers issues to them and in a day or two they revert back to us and we share back the information to them. We have been aggressively promoting uh, organic cultivation all this while, and we hope to be able to uh, drill it down into the system further on the importance of uh, organic cultivation. And also if we can actually leverage on a different channel for them, then it, it will become more profitable for them at any point of time. 
So uh, uh, operationally, we operate out of two centers. One is in Shillong and the other in Tura. And uh, we have almost about 18 uh, uh, vehicles as of now. The good thing about this uh, COVID uh, thing that happened in March and April, it, uh, it is not good news definitely, but for us what happened is the kind of uh, demand that was created for ITs led us to basically enroll another channel of these vehicles. So uh, these vehicles are basically the market uh, vehicles. These are the market commercial vehicles available all across. What we did was that we brought them into our app and we are testing with them right now. So the moment this is successful, in fact, a lot of them have uh, agreed that, you know, it has benefited them. So what happened is that these people have on board with us and now we are using them for a transportation of use from all across because our 18 to 20 vehicles can no longer meet that demand. So we now have a fleet of almost 100 vehicles and there are another 400 vehicles on standby. So it's a huge network of vehicles that we have managed to uh, bring on board at um, the, this time and we are transporting uh, produce from you know a mere 400 kgs of bananas to you know tons of peas and all that. So uh, if you look at this, uh, why we were able to handle uh, uh, the kind of distress sale of the farmers during this COVID-19 period was simply we, uh, we were able to connect the buyers with these farmers immediately. Now we already have a set of buyers. A lot of buyers who were at the market, uh, at the mandis. So these people were Basically, they were people who simply were sitting there and they were waiting for farmers to come and bring the produce. Now, the difficulty, the, the difficulty during COVID was that the farmer was not able to come. So what happened, I had to basically activate our buyer system. Some of them were not in agricultural uh, area also, but they took it upon themselves to, you know, help out the farmers during this time. So we gave the leads to them and through our vehicles, they went across all the state and pick up as much vegetable produce as was there. So if you look at it, the distress selling that was that happened in other states, maybe did not happen in Meghalaya, but I would not say it was zero also, but definitely we had been able to uh, you know, do something good for the farmers. So what was act what actually happened during this period was simply uh, you know making the the model more efficient and people became more aware about what was ITs earlier because of uh, because of the opportunity to sell elsewhere people were not looking towards ITs but during the last two months you know uh, we became uh, prominent in their lives we tried to help them as much as possible I've had uh, people, you know, uh, people selling high perishables, uh, perishable vegetables like mustard leaves, for instance, where, you know, none of our buyers were willing to procure for the simple reason of, you know, low shelf lives. So we just used the vehicle, uh, the vehicle uh, uh, services that we have, took them out of their village, bring them to a market point which was open on a particular day and they were able to sell the produce in, you know, in a span of six to seven hours and they were very happy. So this was something that we were able to do. So it is not that the system was not there, the system was in place already. It was just that people did not use it to the, uh, you know, did not use it efficiently then, but now they have become aware of it and I think ITs you know, have been able to make a change in their lives in the last two months. Um, we use a lot of technology also. Uh, we operate out of a center which operates like uh, similar to a call center. We have modeled this entire thing like a 108 uh, model. Uh, so we are saying that uh, the, the center, we call it as an angry response center. So it's all about response to calls of, from the farmers. So the vehicles are known as angry response vehicles. So these are the things that we have managed to do for them. And I hope that, you know, we have been able to uh, bring a little, a little benefit to them through this entire thing that we did. Uh, we have an app, like I told you, we are there through a portal, through a website. 
and we have an, uh, a CRM kind of module which we operate, which was built and housed in the DIC premises in Mumbai only. And uh, we are in the process of bringing more changes into the app, where we are looking at a model which is very similar to Uber, and we are uh, for the commercial vehicles. So we are bringing in that model now. Testing has been done. We are trying to now enroll all these vehicles and incentivize them for the first six months to a year, maybe to use the services, so that our farmers benefit from this. <clears throat> So uh, the advantages of our vehicle is basically, you know, the, if you look at this, the ease of booking a vehicle through phone or an app, he can sit at home and do the entire booking, easy payment methods. I mean, for those who have uh, uh, a debit card payment option, they can use it available on all days, can carry any weight, any transport, any distance, even interstate. So all these we are offering to the farmers so that they can actually uh, reap benefits out of this. So uh, this is what we are planning to do. We have to cover the entire farmers in the state. So an estimate is around four lakhs for two, four and a half lakhs farmers is there in the state. So like I told you, we are just a mere 10%, 10 to 15% right now. So we still have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, because of uh, the scenario in the last two months, now we are going to basically enroll all these cargo vehicles from a 25 tonner to a, you know 800 kg uh, vehicle. Then uh, we are looking at more aggregation centers, uh, scaling up the supply chain with uh, more cold storage facilities. So we are, you know, uh, doing all these scoutings and I mean, only time will tell that whether we can implement all of these. But actually, the, uh, according to me, these are the most efficient things that we need to do uh, in the system or rather built in the system so that, you know, our farmers can actually benefit from it all. So. Um, we're looking at bringing more institutional buyers to the state. I mean, we have had talks with uh, big corporate houses. Uh, we are trying to uh, leverage that into a particular area where there's a control and where, you know, their model can be followed in terms of generating the quality that they need. So we're looking at all that uh, in the near future. Yeah, so that is it from my side. I think I've not taken more than what I'm supposed to. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, we can take it up a little later, right? Thanks, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Gavin. It was indeed a, a pleasure listening to you and uh, on what the government of Meghalaya has been doing and the IT team has been doing to you know facilitate uh, forward connection for the farmers and. Uh, small farmers and farmer collective i just uh, yeah questions and answers we will be taking later on i just had one uh, i query uh, whether uh, backward linkages like providing uh, fertilizers or pesticide organic uh, fertilizer pesticide to the farmers are also part of what i team does or it's just the forward linkage uh, no no uh, so we are doing it but this is basically not on a subsidy model so we don't have anything on the subsidy model so it is based uh, mainly uh, driven through uh, market, driven through demand. So it is all that. So uh, I don't have anything. Uh, we don't operate anything on the subsidy model at all. Yeah. So okay. if basically they, they they need any support in terms of procuring it, we will help them. But it comes at the market cost. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So now, yeah, we come to the final speaker of our session. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Brajeshwar from S. Agri. Uh, so, uh, Brajeshwar, I have, I think, met a couple of months back for the first time, and then we were in the same line of uh, kind of work. So, uh, what I can say to the speaker, uh, say to the audience is that, see, uh, once the agri business starts off, then there are a lot of financial challenges that the farmers and uh, agri business has to follow up with or suffer. So, that's where companies like Sagri, S agree comes into place. So I think uh, Brajesh will be able to more tell about what are the interventions they have been doing in India and uh, what they foresee uh, as the future of uh, uh, agri technologies and uh, how agri technology will be able to benefit the lives of the farmers. Okay, over to you, uh, Mr. Brajesh. Hi, thank you, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. 
My name is Brijeshwar and I lead the Sagri team here in India. So during, especially during the COVID pandemic that happened, we have been planning quite a lot of interesting stuff, technology, satellites, soil sampling, IoT and all of those. But when, you know, when things goes bad, everything goes down to the grassroots level of how you can help the farmers. And one of the key things, or a few of the very, very key things that we figured out was that they are scared that the farmers produce, they're not able to sell it. The buyers are negotiating in such a way that it is drastically not beneficial to them at all. Something, uh, a tomato that they were supposed to sell it for 28 rupees a kg, they started selling at 10, 30, or even 15. So it's really, really bad. So, so we decided to fast track all the uh, fancy stuff and remove all of those and figure out what and how can we help them. So farmers were stuck, you know, they, they have the harvest and they don't have a market to sell to. Uh, so it's, which means that the crops might either go wasted or they have to sell it at dirt cheap prices, which eventually harm, harm them, right? So we thought no farmers should be able or should be afraid that their crop may not sell. That was the one thing that we came up with. The other thing is that when something like this pandemic happens, the big question that we asked the farmer when we talked to them was, why are you not insured? There is a natural crop insurance happening in India and uh, the government will pay you. It may take time, but why don't you insure the crops? So two things came up. One of the thing is that they don't have access to immediate capital to pay even the very small premium that crop insurance you have to pay. The other thing very uh, surprising, was, surprising was the lack of awareness. Many of the farmers don't even have a clue that there's a national crop insurance scheme that you can pay a very small amount so that you can insure your crops. So those were the two findings that we did. Uh, so in all of this whole journey of research of uh, how the farmers are, uh, the problems they have, what do they want to do, what is the main thing, everything. Uh, we can talk about technology, how we help them, apps, and all of those, right? But when it comes down to that particular farming part of it, most of the farmers, what they say when you hear about satellite technology is that, what do I do with it? I don't even know how to use WhatsApp properly. My son, my grandson, my daughter, teach me how to use Facebook to talk with them, but it's still very difficult for them. So whatever we do, we have to do it in the background, in the back end. And then whatever you interact with the farmers is, how do you serve them immediately? And one of the biggest problems that farmers face, the immediate problem they want is, can you give us money? So that is the number one thing. So the number one problem of farmers in India is, can I have access to favorable credit? I will pay you back, but can I do it easier? And in fact, so more than half of Indian farmers do not have access to institutional credits like your from the government or even from private banks. They don't have access to it because of the lack of documents, because of the lack of uh, uh, properly owning a farmland in their name, all of those, right? So more than 50% of the farmers don't even have access to that. So what they end up doing is they go to the local loan shark and borrow money at a very, very high premium interest. 35% is like luxury, like 40%, 45%, sometimes even 50% interest rate is not uncommon. So they borrow from that and eventually they do their farming and the season goes on and they harvest it. And at the same time, because they don't have access to proper market, uh, especially in the rural places in India, they end up selling to the same loan shark, to the same rich guy. So the whole vicious loop of not having access to easy credit or good interest rate credit money goes on and on. You borrow, you sell it at a cheaper price and then go back and borrow again and it goes on and on. We wanted, at Sagri, we wanted to solve that problem. We may be using satellite technology, looking at the crop cycles, the greeneries, calculating the NDVI of a particular farmland over ages. We use IoT, plug into their farmlands to calculate the soil fertility, do soil testing and all of those. But at the end of the day, we just use that as a data point so that we can give money to them without asking for a collateral, but having some sort of a credit score because if you have a farmland and if it is producing enough, and if we, if we believe that because of the whole fertility of your soil, the way you're producing it, 
your yield in the last couple of years, we can predictively analyze and tell you or give you loans with the risks that you might be able to pay us. That's what's been happening for quite a while. And uh, Sagri is uh, something that started way back in Japan, I think 2018. Uh, by our global CEO. And uh, we already are working with the Japanese government to help them with underutilized farmland by combining satellite technology. We have satellite access to Japanese uh, Jaja, which is similar to the US NASA. We also have this uh, access to Sentinel-2 from European satellite. And then combine the data from the satellite and back in the ground level with the IoT sensors on the field itself we can predictively analyze and tell more than 90% uh, accuracy of particular uh, farmland productivity or underutilized farmlands in Japan. Uh, and that's how we help the government do their work more properly. We cannot just superimpose or bring back that technology in India and just use it. It's entirely different. We have to work in an entirely different way of doing it. Uh, the recent COVID pandemic has fast-tracked us into doing something really, really dirty, really, really cheap, and give money to the uh, farmers. The way to do that is we have tried to partner with, uh, with farmer producer organizations, ag tech startups, and groups of farmers who already are working with the farmers, and we try to give money through them, right? So even since this uh, Apple One, we have partnered with uh, Fresh is Fresh from Manipur in the Northeast, and we have already given them loans uh, to the stranded farmers, farmers who want to do cultivation real quickly, who want to transport their uh, produce. So it has been a really phenomenally successful business despite the whole lockdown and everything that's happening around. Uh, we have also given uh, another 50 loans to uh, the village of Chindamani here in Karnataka and we specifically specified working with 50 women farmers. So that was a really, uh, you know, very a uh, uh, really nice feeling of the ability to help them when they are in such a situation. Um, we have also partnered with some non-banking financial corporations such as Grow More and the P2P microfinance lending uh, the platform called Rangde. Rangde is a very popular one here in India, help quite a bit of small time entrepreneurs and their current focus is to help agriculture, farmer and give them zero percent interest. In fact, that whole idea kick us into giving loans to farmers with zero, zero interest during this COVID pandemic. So uh, the whole bigger picture goal is to give loans at a very, very simple interest, way, way favorable to the farmers. During this pandemic, we're doing it zero interest. Uh, this is one of the picture, if you look at the slides uh, of some women, uh, they were well sanitized, uh, sensitized and uh, they come in group, uh, so it was okay, and we give them money, I hand them directly cash. Uh, we have another thousand loans lined up so that we can start giving out very soon. We will be finishing another hundred this month in May itself in partnership with Rangde. In fact, Rangde is going to do from 23rd of May onwards in partnership with NDTB, a massive pen white telethon, uh, pan India telethon, where anybody can fund farmers that they need it. Uh, we are partnering with them, we're funding through them. Yep, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, our website is at sagri.co. I am reachable at the website uh, and, uh, uh, and the contacts there. Email, email me anytime, any questions. Uh, we're looking for more and more partners to work together with. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brijesh. It was nice hearing you and uh, what your company has been doing and planning to do in India to facilitate uh, financial services or financial inclusion for small and marginal farmers. Uh, yeah, one point I would like to uh, highlight is that in Assam, at least I know that the per month interest rate is uh, with the loan sharks is about 10%. So per annum it comes to 120%, right? So then the farmer is never able to repay it back completely. So they fall into that debt cycle with them. So. Yeah, that's, so that's one, one of the observations that I would like to share. So yeah, now we have already concluded the complete four sessions. So we can take up uh, Q&A. Uh, yeah, we can take up the question and answer sessions. So uh, who uh, whoever wants to speak can just unmute themselves and then ask the question and please address 
uh, whom you are asking the question to and then uh, they will reply uh, on it yeah is there any uh, question with the participants Rajit, can I come in? If no, yeah, yes, sir. coming in just to yes. just to initiate, I guess. Yes, sure, sir. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, two questions. Very, very lovely uh, sessions. I think all the four panelists immense learning. Uh, immediate quest quick questions uh, to Oinam, Uh I come from a finance background. Uh, not so far back, I was in a, another institution which is to do with finance. And one of the major, major problem, as you rightly identified. One immediate quick question. Uh, you're working with the agri financial sector, unlike microfinance. Uh, so how are you looking at covering uh, the problem of uh, uh, what I would call is uh, risk in the, uh, the price risk? Number two is the risk related to because this is one of the major problems that you occur in the, in the agricultural markets. One is the price risk. Two is the normal risk of disasters, which occur quite often. So that is something that you cannot predict. I think, uh, I mean, like, like you can predict the productivity of this one through that IOTs, et cetera. But how would you deal with this? Uh, in, the, in the case, I'll just give you a small lesson on this. Uh, we had worked on, uh, uh, in Garo Hills on this. And very interesting, the middlemen that we are talking about actually worked through this. Uh, they, they figured out a risk cycle of about four years. And uh, so they give the credit again, despite the fact that the clock fails, and then they come back again. So it's like a four year cycle. So they've evolved a product around this. Um, in case with you, have you thought about that? Because agricultural markets here are really uh, I mean, plagued with these two major issues. So the first honest confession, I'm not a financial expert. Uh, okay. I'm more of an entrepreneur and technology has always been my uh, prior experience. This is the second ag tech experience. Uh, so answering number one is price lyrics. What we have done right now is that we, while we are collecting the data and trying to form some sort of a risk analysis through technology, the immediate uh, assessment that or the good feel, feeling that we have to ourselves is we're working very closely with the partners who are already working with the farmers in the ground for the, at least two plus years. So when they give us a list of farmers that, hey, these are the tentative list of farmers that we might be able to give them loan, they right. are already, even though we don't agree legally, that they are already saying that these are the farmers who have been doing successfully, they're doing it uh, and they will pay back. That's right. the first thing that we're doing right now. Other than that, we'll keep experimenting it. We'll keep studying the uh, uh, financial data, financial history and see where we can mitigate as much as possible. But we also know that the risk will happen. We just want to do it in such a way that we can keep the number as low as possible. Uh, okay. That's the best viable option right now. Uh, we don't have a, a, a silver bullet to do that. Um, and I don't think anybody has it. If you have it, you're practically somewhere. We just wanted to copy one of the most successful financial transaction uh, institute happening in India is the microfinancing. So we want to marry that whole idea of microfinance into financing for agriculture. That's the only thing that we know might possibly work out. Well, uh, I think Absolutely. And fantastic. Only thing is, like I said, I, I thought so. I think you have picked up the model of microfinance. The only element is these two risks is something that you probably have to factor as you go ahead. So, I mean, we all have to do it first. So I guess, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so yeah. what I keep saying to uh, our accountant, our, uh, our lawyer who keep asking, what if people don't pay is, I ask them, if you don't do it, you're a hundred percent failure. If you do it, you at least know you can have a 50% yeah. chance of succeeding it. Yeah, yeah. So we have to do it. We have to learn through the data. Uh, the other good feel factor about microfinance is microfinance is the only sector in India that's growing at 45% KKR. So no other industry grows at 45% KKR, year on year, CAGR, 45%. That's brilliantly interesting. And uh, any financial expert will say that's a risk we can take, right? The second thing, disaster, uh, I don't know. I don't have an idea. When disasters happen, we'll figure out. 
uh, or we'll keep learning through it. Uh, we don't want to pressure a farmer who is, uh, whose everything is flooded. We don't want to go around asking him or her for the money. We'll figure something out. I think one of the key things is to, we want to package insurance as part of the loan so that that will help them at least. Uh, uh, and if something goes good, they will, or they might pay us back. So the insurance that I was talking about, uh, we will just have them as a premium as part of the loan. We'll tell them, we'll pay you, we'll pay your premium. So when you pay back, it's part of that. So that's the one. Thank you, thank you. Someone else can pick up. I would, I would just like to add a bit on that. So some of our startups are also looking to address similar issues. And one of the things which can also be done is that, you know, if the startup can work on the market linkage bit and digitize the FPO's loan books. So basically you build a book uh, by doing trade and take that book to a bank and get the approval for the loan. You know, so a lot of them, a lot of them basically either they are, give, they are in the input credit business or just the credit business. No one is linking the output. So basically the reason why banks cannot give uh, loans to these FPOs is they don't have anything to look at. Right. I mean, what is the basis? So if something can be digitized at their end and one of our startups is very intelligently managed to do that, get, uh, get the loan sanction from these PSUs, federal banks of the world. And he is very intelligently able to give loans at 11, 12%, which is fa far more cheaper even than the microfinance companies, which are still very high. Cool. Uh, in fact, while you were presenting, I was noting it down that I should be contacting you to get in touch with your startups. One of the key things, which because of the short time, I was not able to uh, make it part of the slide is that we're already working with a uh, NBFC, another NBFC called Bone Credit. So what, help, what it helps us do is we can issue a unique number identifier and they can even get a credit card kind of plastic card for the farmers and they can have a QR code. So they would be able to buy even without bringing any form of cash from any pre-approved merchants to buy seeds, fertilizer and anything to do that. We are already working, our engineering team is already working to plugging into the API and uh, work with that. So that's the thing that is gonna happen in the background. Uh, they, the bond credit guys are already working with the drivers of Uber, Ola, Swiggy, and all of us to give them uh, rolling credit every week. So we want to do that for farmers too. Okay. Okay. Uh, there are two questions which is open for all the panelists. Uh, uh, let's start with the first question. Is by uh, Pushpa Rani. Ms. Pushpa Rani has asked that the sc scarcity of rains is a ban for farmer. Uh, how do you suggest a better way to implement rainwater harvesting system on a large scale or on a larger scale? So she is already uh, she is working as an architect and she is proposing rainwater harvesting system to individual in a smaller client base. So she wants to know whether uh, how to do that in a larger scale. So it's open for the panelists. Anybody? Yeah. Brajeshwar, Ashish want to start. So what I, what I can say is I can connect them to uh, the technical experts on this uh, who would be in a better position to, to answer that. So if they can email me the details, then I can collect them to relevant authorities. What is also happening on the farm side is a lot of startups are getting into control production. So basically vertical indoor farms, semi-indoor farms, where they are enabling tech technology and they've done extensive R&D around 60 to 65 commodities where they can to, I would say up to 95% uh, accuracy predict the kind of supply. They can also keep a consistent price range. So basically with open farms, you can't do that because weather pays a spoil spot. But in poly houses and in indoor environment, since weather is not a criteria, a lot of things can be predicted. Even you can predict the price of a particular commodity throughout the year, you know, with, with assuring a consistent supply, consistent quality and all those parameters. In terms of rainwater harvesting, I can connect uh, them to appropriate uh, technical people. Okay. Rajeshwar, you wanted to add something. May not be a direct solution, but uh, in my prior, uh, I would say, uh, initiative that I was trying to do. So one of the things that we figured out is agriculture is one of the, it in fact contributes 25% of the climate change happening around the world. Mm. And one of the key thing is it consumes more than 90% more of freshwater uh, 
uh, for agriculture, when you do it the normal way, when you grow it on the, uh, the soil and stuff and just pump in more and more water without even doing that. So the way to do, and it is, it's a kind of like a solve problem for many people, but uh, there are a few ways that you already know there's drip irrigation that you can do. The other thing is, um, I have been in touch with a Japanese company and they are prototyping uh, a very, very scientifically well thought out done uh, product called uh, Ski Pond. Ski Pond is a, so if I put one liter of the Ski Pond in about 500 liter of water and a plant that needs X amount of water, they can do it like one tenth of that. So if you can solve it scientifically, you would be able to, uh, so it's specifically targeted for drought uh, and drought area where you don't need to water so much. So that's interesting. Um, it's still in the beta. I have one packet with me. I want to try it out. Uh, the other thing is look at uh, things such as the cheapest way to do is without going into all of this hydroponics is to look at things like Dutch bucket farming uh, for vegetable farmers. Uh, the Dutch way of farming is very, very interesting. Um, Seps water load more like twice, three times of what you would typically say. Okay. Any other panelists that would like to add upon it? Uh, the rainwater uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I'd like to add one thing because, see, I don't yes, know, everybody is water scarcity is there everywhere, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, in our Ekas University, uh, very good findings. Suppose, uh, because in Northeast we grow rice, okay? Yeah. And we give buns. But main problem is farmers are nowadays, they very casually they do rice cultivation. Previously, in our, when our fathers and our grandfathers they are doing, they give more emphasis on rice buns, okay? So in one experiment, we have increased the buns up to one foot, about 10, 10 inches. Okay. Because farmers do not give more emphasis. But if they give buns up to Eight inch or nine inch, okay. This keeps water. What they can retain water for the next crop. Without any irrigation, they can easily grow. They can easily grow a rabi crop. Mm -hmm. So this water conservation is very good for our northeast region because we get more more than two thousand mm, okay. So this much water we can conserve. But there is a concept of zolkun also. We can uh, keep the water in a bigger pond, okay. Mm -hmm. So there's lot many technologies are there. There's no doubt of technology. Or water conservation in Northeast India. Okay, and by the, I, I would like to thank all the speakers because very nicely all uh, spoke. Uh, I also thank uh, Asis. He has done a wonderful job. I think they have into. It. So I want to ask uh, one question to Asis. So um, because he has, I think, in that uh, indigra, they have included everything na, from custom herring to extension to startups, seed investment. So I want to ask Asis, what is the challenging, most challenging? Because he is in the agri uh, sector, isn't he? So the most challenging part is the yeah. to make the farmer agree to pay for technology. You <laughs> know, in, in, in a country like India, 85% of the farmers are small and marginal farmers. Yes. So initially, if you go about building a business model where the farmer is supposed to pay, uh, that's not going to happen, right? Then it yes. becomes a chicken and an egg story. How does a startup self-sustain? So... Yeah. Our advice and based on our experience in the past, uh, we've pivoted a lot of business models to identify new revenue streams so that the startups can sustain. So go after institutional investors, go after retailers, or go after well-funded FPOs, or go after CSR agencies who can, who can do free pilots at their end with their set of farmers, but someone needs to pay you, right? So a yeah. lot of times that's what you call the product market fit, right? I mean, you have a technology which looks good, but if there is no paying customer for a technology, then what do you do with that technology right? Mm -hmm. at the end of the day? So there needs to be a product market fit somewhere, somehow. And you need to, so, uh, so uh, in our experience, a lot of the uh, startups and the farm advisory piece, right? Where you give weekly information to a farmer in terms of what needs to be sown, what all activities need to be done. Those have not been able to sustain because they're paying customers were farmers or concentrate on funded FPOs, which are World Bank funded or you know, State Bank funded, where there is sufficient infrastructure on the ground. So when I say sufficient infrastructure, I mean there are some sorting grading stations, there is some infrastructure where they can actually do some value added stuff uh, and reasonably funded active where there are trading in 
if not agri outputs, but at least agri input business, so that there is something something for you to give them. The other is obviously in terms of skill adaptation also. You know, a lot of time and capacity building goes about training these FPOs and farmers how to use technology. So technology has to be simple, you know, because at the end of the day, FPO is was supposed to be a uh, to run like a private company, but it is actually being uh, run by the farmers at the end of the day, right? So uh, maybe a couple of them might be progressive in nature, but how do you how do you how do you get everyone to adapt to technology? So there is skill adaptability, technology the adaptability issue. Plus, obviously, most of the farmers, since the small there are small holdings lot of business models don't turn out to be viable. Let's say farm mechanization doesn't turn out to be viable. Precision agriculture does not turn out to be viable. But the promising thing which I see going forward is that everything will be centered around an FPO because obviously the small and marginal farmer story cannot change. But what can change is the collaborative efforts of these clusters and how do you go about strengthening these clusters at the end of the day, right? So it might take five years, seven years, but a lot of activities in the future is going to be centered around the FPO. So be it uh, credit, be it intervention of technology, be it the input business, be it aggregation and output supplies, uh, pretty much everything is going to go to the FPO, right? And cut out the intermediaries, at least some of the intermediaries in between. Thank you, Asis. You are doing a wonderful job. Very Thank good. You. Uh, uh, Gunadit. Yes, sir. Uh, next, my I want to ask uh, that uh, Chulai. Okay, very nice. Yeah, Mr. Gavin. Uh, items, items. Yeah, yeah. items. So Mr. I Gavin. want to ask. Uh, yes, because one thing I think they have a wonderful. Yes, yes, sir. They, they want, want doing wonderful work. I think uh, I'm very fascinated to hear that you are managing uh, also distress selling. Because in Assam, uh, we are facing distress selling is very go, uh, very much uh, rampant this time. Because because of this uh, COVID nineteen, because you have managed yes. in Meghalaya, it's very nice. So I congratulate you for your nice work. But you have mentioned one replicating the model across the entire northeast. So what is your plan for that? I, once I have seen you know slide the replicating the model across the entire uh, northeast. Yes. So I think now you are concentrating uh, on Meghalaya. Only, uh, you know? Actually, what we were doing is. Yes, yes, we are now concentrating on uh, only on Meghalaya, but we, what we are thinking is that uh, we are doing uh, the full-scale testing in the state of Meghalaya first. So if this uh, model actually is successful, and when I say successful, I'm talking from a government perspective. I'm not looking at profits. I'm not looking at, you know, uh, monetary gains, but I'm looking at whether it is able to help the farmer at the ground level or not. So I'm looking and I'm, uh, I'm talking from that perspective. And if I feel that our farmers are actually using this platform to the full extent, and if we can replicate this, then we will be happily replicating it with other state governments and all that. So that is open in our minds. Uh, and in fact, uh, one or two governments have approached us and we said, uh, give us some time. I mean, in a few months time, maybe we can talk about uh, replicating something similar in another state. Very good. And I think you have covered only 10% till now, isn't it? The farmers, how many percentage you cover? Cover is, percentage you cover is? Hello? Hello? Yeah, he has said about 10%. Oh, 10%. Okay, about okay. 10%. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there is a question from one Mr. Dutta on yeah. what is the potential ask. for, oh, you wanted to ask that? Okay. No, fine. Uh, yeah. You if you have the answer to that, you can yeah, add yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So the, the scene of uh, minor fruit, it's all about volume here in Northeast. You don't have a right kind of a volume. So while, if you say seasonal fruits are in demand, and like this Tekkada Tenga and things like that, which are very popular, I have somehow picked up the word, but I don't, I hope I have, you know, pronounced it properly. Uh, you know, these fruits have a, a value in terms of at the point in time when it is actually coming out ripe for a certain purpose. Humidity is very high. It helps quench the right kind of thirst. So there's a lot around it scientifically if you were to see. But the problem with the market is until there is a volume, market, market just doesn't absorb that. The cost becomes quite high for you to reach it to market. Incidentally, we have one incubator of ours who is doing ready to serve drink, beverage, 
out of these kind of minor food so his competition is a small little fruity pouch of that 10 rupee pack versus what he is trying to do with his say minor food uh, extracted kind of a thing which is giving in a bottle so cost somewhere are prohibitive it's fine right now he gets a grant from us and he's starting to do all that but until he finds his place in the market there's a certain degree of acceptance then people at a local area understand okay this goes well but if you were to offer it without preservatives it has to travel a certain amount of distance it needs a certain level of sophistication when you market something you know like a paper boat marketed you know mm-hmm. that's going to be very different from how you market a drink like this so there are the potential is there only only when you say there is a considerable volume that can generate this kind of a processing to be done and unfortunately there is no such kind of primary processing also that has been carried out a lot of times you find the fruit just falling down and then people are trying to organize that into mm. so that is as regards minor fruits i have i have myself worked in the area of uh, maps which is medicinal and aromatic plants uh, across in manipur and you know those places i have been to i worked with national medicinal plant board Uh, my take on map is that uh, here the problem is something uh, different uh, while it's a very rich biodiverse place that we are in the kind of uh, you know uh, thing that we get from map here and if you were to look at the user end user industry what is the end use of it so if you were to see most of these factories and uh, companies are based out of the bangalore of the world it has to travel distances like that mm-hmm. and typically these are all collectors so there are guys who go up the hill on the way down they just pick up whatever comes in their hand mm. give it to a trader that so it's a typical opaque trade and if you were to see the potential of it what comes from here or if you were to see the big five which are doing from india none of them you will find here in the north east yeah. the kind of things that you find here in the north east are something which doesn't even let's say even tcm it is a traditional chinese medicine where it is find finding its use even in tcm the kind of a volume that we are talking about the quality there are a lot of issues around quality typically grown in the wild you need to do a lot of cleaning sorting grading so these habits are just not not available here so tough very tough so it boils down to just ginger just boils down to turmeric mm. and those two the ones which can typically be processed as powdered ones where it is finding a ancillary use in the final product it's not the primary use so that's where it stands on map as my i hope that answers out with that question i'll just add to uh, your point you have mentioned thekera right i think a lot of people might not know thekera is all, uh, also known as garcinia which is a you know commercially viable product and even in south india and in the western india they have it as kokum so uh, there has a potential but the thing is that you have to do a processing uh, mr amita with you Are listening you have to do the processing of it so that it becomes viable for the consumer to purchase it or the company that you are trying to you know approach because raw material might not go there as a in the raw form so you have to look into that uh, finished product so we have one last uh, okay we have two more questions so i'll take with a question by mr shubham ghosh so he has asked about the scope of agri uh, dairy farming in assam in the larger scale so if anybody would be able to answer that very specific to assam and then yeah okay okay mr dr kar yeah my take on uh, agri uh, and this uh, dairy is just the same first we need to see what kind of uh, uptake it is there here if you were to see why is uh, lal sa or red tea very popular here simply because there is no much dairy farming that happens here over time now with processed cheese paneer and what not that is coming even there the behavioral there is a lot that has to do with behavior so people are not so used to dairy farming therefore because it's a very intensive activity there's a lot of work you have to do when you have a cow at home there's a lot of activity here we are not used to it so if we can change that you have a group of people uh, coming together wanting to do it then you find a market for it because it's a perishable stuff there's a lot of money that goes into input buying and to maintain it and all that while we find it is uh, you know a, a place like this where there's a lot of greenery but that's not how it is done uh you need silage especially during the uh, flood times and all that so there's a lot of money that goes into it uh, if some farmer groups can come together and start working closer to a production center you should have your consumer start from there change the habit make people uh, realize the importance of having milk and giving it to the children around 
you know, it's like an acquired taste. At this point in time, even in places like Guwahati, I have not found that happening. <laughs> That's my but but hai, I think there's a good scope for that. There's a good scope for that. Isn't yeah, it? I, as I said, the potential exists as long as you have people working towards it in both sides, see consumer side as well as the people who are coming together to produce it. Right now, it's like a just starting it here in a desert. It's almost like that. And I'll also like to add to that. I mean, see, dairy as an idea is has been on for uh, centuries, but the skill lies in execution because there's a lot of micromanagement, right? Yeah. Capacity building needs to be done. Supply chain is very tricky. And especially when you talk about liquid mills, the margins are very thin. So, you know, any wastage gets uh, pretty much, it goes in the profits that you make. So the skill lies in how do you go about creating a brand or how do you go about creating a value added product as well? In, in the top line, if you look at it, 80% of the revenues will be coming from liquid milk. But what do you do about the 20%? Is your cheese or your, you know, rasgullas, chenas or whatever you make value added, is it being uh, sold at a premium? How effectively you go about ma marketing or branding those things is, is, is a skill basically of an entrepreneur. It's more than the knowledge, I would say, go to market managing supply chains like uh, Dr. Karthik also said, uh, it's 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 one hell of a task to manage and you know there is it is very chaotic on a day to day basis so i mean even for big companies like amul and all it has taken a lot of time to get the supply chain right because if there's something there are more issues on the procurement side but at the same time you need to aggregate demand you need to have sizable demand to generate a backward uh, supply linkage so it becomes again a chicken and an egg story yeah if i may yeah thank you if i may also add i mean Still, the perception over here in Northeast is that the cow's milk is for the calf, right? As a tribal community, I know that there are a lot of uh, repercussion kind of attitude that the cow milk should be for the calf and not for human consumption. So that also needs to change. So the adoption adoption of uh, milk consumption and milk based uh, product consumption increases. So we have a few more questions, then we can wind it up. I think one question is for uh, Karthik and Dr. Karthik and on by Tulika Pandey, ma'am. On uh, what is the market potential of specialty tea? So yeah, very good. From Go for course. it. Go for yeah. it. Okay. There's a niche segment. The hmm. Assam and Northeast is all about tea. At least Assam is for tea. Go for specialty tea. Uh, go to the high end. If you can do the right kind of packaging, right designing, bring, bring about some innovative aspect in it. We have a couple of uh, incubators at our center. We could, you know, put you in touch with them. They could perhaps share some more of their stories, get the right things done, uh, avoid the wrong uh, stuff. Uh, people should not be doing, you know, pot leaf factories or, you know, churning mm -hmm. out something and, you know, things like that. They're not happening on the ground. We can put you in touch. But my simple answer for that is it's got a great potential. Okay. Must go for it. Okay. So the next question, I think, is in general for all the panelists. Uh, uh, in the post-COVID world, what are the technological measures or, or methodology should be adopted by farmers or agro? Uh, I think it should be processors, I guess. If they have made, nah, it should be agro processors. What is the technology adoption of farmers and agro processors? I think the whole, uh, Mr. Sur Surajit, the whole session was on that, that uh, adoption of technology has been the key uh, for moving forward uh, by all the speakers. They have spoken on it. So I think that uh, directly answers to your uh, question. So, okay, we'll take two more. Two, there are three more questions. Okay. Um, uh, they, they hung. They hung. Brahma has asked to show or share some light on agro producer company limited. Maybe he's asking about the FPC formation. Uh, what is related and how it is related to agri business or technology and how it works in Northeast. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, see, uh, there are a lot of farmer producer companies here in Northeast. You would have anything around 250 to 300 companies. How many of them are actually working like a company is a big question mark. That's another part of it. So uh, you can't compare an FPC that's based out of say Gujarat, Maharashtra or Rajasthan to what we have having here. But having said that, the best part, they're collectivizing their effort. The effort of buying, the effort of selling, negotiating better prices. So go, go for it. And uh, I mean, the way India, I'm sorry on this show, I'm saying this, but the way the government is going state or center, you'll have more number of FPOs than you'll have farmers now. That will be the scenario. Uh, you'll have more FPCs than FPOs than uh, even farmers. Yeah. So that's the way forward. I think the unit of uh, or the metrics for uh, measuring success and 
even doling out uh, you know uh, schemes would be spos so please go for it if you can the biggest issue is you have to just look at your bottom i mean the bottom of the pyramid in terms of the right bricks that you are laying at the you know in place first as a foundation the farmers should have an understanding why they are coming together the group of those 20 odd people should be really a cohesive group so the, the the strength actually lies in the most weakest link as they say so if you are having a good set of farmers coming together working together together having an economic activity that's very very critical yeah. otherwise yeah. you see an fpc of about say 300 500 farmers only 10 20 50 are active and only they call the shots that's actually not an fpc but there is a potential okay so I, I will add a very small stop. So everybody here is interested in some way or the other of being an entrepreneur or doing something different, right? So many people tend to ask, especially first time entrepreneurs is, what do I do this, what do I do that and all of this. Actually, I made the same mistake myself. Forget everything and select one key problem that you are uh, totally into it and want to solve it. Once you find that problem, Fall in love with that problem, but not with a solution. Try multiple solutions. It doesn't matter. A very, very tiny problem. Solve it. Go really, really deep into it. Once you solve that, you can spread out. So anything to do with will this be profitable? If you keep asking that, you'll keep asking that your entire life and you'll still not be doing it. Just go in. Don't worry about failure, but try to iterate really, really fast. So if you're experimenting something for one month and nothing is coming out of it, just move to the next. But it should be in the periphery of the problem that you're trying to solve. So if it is a farmer problem, go down. What kind of farmer problem you're trying to solve? Is it knowledge? Is it connectivity? Is it marketplace? Everything itself is massively big. And, and the only unfortunate thing that is that farming in India is a huge volume thing. It's a huge quantity thing, right? It contributes less than I think 17% of the Indian GDP. So, but still uh, it's massive thing. You can go solve this very small problem. Once you do that, everything else becomes uh, successively easier on their own. But you need to figure out one thing. Don't worry about what happened all of those. Just keep hammering it. Uh, and you will be able to learn a lot more by doing that very, very tiny thing. So instead of knowing so many about agricultural stuff from everywhere, you can have a general idea by reading or talking to people. But one, there should be one topic that anybody asks you you should be the expert in everything in that all the way there. Then you will be able to win that. So that's how you start from a niche, a very, very tiny success story, then keep building on top of that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bhutisha. So the final question is actually, uh, okay. There is Creative Garden, which has asked, what about the hub, hubs farming and the market linkages for the same? I think, uh, for uh, for the herbs, I think Mr. Uh, Dr. Kartikeyan already answered in the medicinal aromatic plant uh, when he discussed about medicinal aromatic plant market linkages. So the production is low, but then if you are doing it commercially, then you have to do it commercially and get it done, uh, process it, and then uh, sell it off. I think that answer. Yeah, you want to add? Yeah, sure. Uh, I didn't want to add to that question, but I wanted to add to what Brajesh uh, just said. Oh, okay. See. Um, since I, I believe this is all about entrepreneurs, we are not talking about what uh, technologies a farmer could adopt and about farmers we could talk at length perhaps again. But coming back to what entrepreneurs could do, what we are looking for, as Rajeshwar rightly said, even at our center, at an incubation center, you find a lot of people coming to us and asking us, what do we do? We want to do something. Okay, What do we do? So I don't, I don't think that's the right way to approach if an entrepreneur comes to us with an idea that there is this thing that I want to do because of some issue, some problem, some challenge, we are solving by doing, bringing in this kind of an idea. In fact, I'll just give you one example, 30 seconds. Uh, so we went to the district administration here in Jorhat, told them, what can we do to help you? I'm sure you must be you know, facing a plethora of challenges during this COVID lockdown. How can we as an incubation center help you? Can you just list us one, two, three, four, and we pick up at least one of them, or maybe a few of them, put it across to our entrepreneurs. That is how we came about this thing that yes, there is a shortage of vegetables to supply. People can't move here, there. How do we go about getting them e-passes and still make sure that they get it so that people don't step out in distress and stuff like that. So sometimes we, instead of waiting for opportunity to come across to us, we could actually walk across there too. So I think district administration and you know, local places is what we need to look for. You know, finding what solution we could offer for their problem, real problem. Okay. Okay. 
yeah with uh, with that thought uh, we conclude our complete session so i would request somebody from the iie team okay shivana so nanu there uh, yeah, yeah over to you shivana nanu yeah thank you so much shivana ji it was indeed a very engaging session all the what i like best and i think that's a message which uh, goes to all these startups here is that agriculture has a lot of opportunity for disruption and covid is actually giving the platform in which uh, people are sort of compelled to change their buying patterns and which is also giving opportunity to you adaptation of technology a great scope so in fact agri sector we talking about problems problems all the time but then it's actually opening up a lot of um, opportunities for engaging technology and then coming up with solutions to how we can actually leverage the situation and the examples particularly of meghalaya have been very hello hello ma'am your mic is off i think uh, yeah hello shripana yeah. uh, yeah yes 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 right so yes. i was just going to uh, yeah would like to so that's it that's the key learning that we had from today's session and if anything uh, i will just add one like uh, guna ji just to wind up uh, sure. no you can end up this session uh, yeah, yeah. shripana okay no thanks a lot uh, guna ji to begin with uh for anchoring the entire beautiful session uh a wonderful thanks to all the panelists uh, uh learning lessons i would take uh, from each one of them one uh, dr kartikian's point of uh, accumulation or volumes i think is a very critical point uh we cannot ignore it i think that's a major challenge and i think uh, that's how we need to work out i think calvin uh have tried to address that issue through uh, various means but i think that is a learning from our entrepreneur who's trying to do that ashish has also brought about a whole lot of issues related to technology and its uses also about uh, the fpos working some challenges related to that thanks a lot for these ex uh, excellent uh, uh, views and perception or uh, pers uh, perspective that you've given uh calvin of course has brought his northeast perspective oinam uh the uh, most critical function of uh, credit as uh, one critical function for every one of it but most important i think the last thing which uh, we ended up is uh, what oinam said and i think dr kartik can also suggest that is for the all the entrepreneurs is that uh, there is a problem but for the entrepreneur it's an opportunity so we look at a problem and we try to solve it that's how entrepreneurs look at it academics look at a problem and try to bring out problems but uh, entrepreneurs are out to solve them uh, that's a big difference between an academic and an entrepreneur so i think yes that's something entrepreneurs look at so thank you everyone i would like to thank the team again uh, from nearest who been really putting on hard work dr shirpana has been in it uh, right from the beginning post covid uh, we also had to shift gear we had planned out a whole lot of physical <laughs> events uh thanks to post covid i think we are also learning uh, as we go forward so thanks a lot and we hope we like to be connected for me it was a learning exercise uh, anything we'll also be connected with you otherwise mm -hmm.